Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our webinar today on preserving privacy using local RAG systems. We've got Llama Index and Tonic Validate to help us out with this topic today. I'm your host, Kiara Colombi. I'm the Director of Product Marketing at Tonic AI, and I'm very happy to be joined by two pioneers in the generative AI and RAG application space. We have Jerry Liu, the CEO and co-founder of Llama Index, a highly popular framework for Llama, uh, for sorry, LLM applications. And from Tonic, we have our very own Adam Kmore, a co-founder of Tonic AI and our head of engineering. We have a lot of great content to cover today, uh, but before we hand it over to the experts, I just wanted to let you know that we welcome your questions at any time. You can ask them in the Q&A area of Zoom, and I will make sure we get them answered. All right, Adam, I'll hand it over to you to introduce yourself and kick us off. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, everyone. My name is Adam. Um, I am one of four co-founders of Tonic. The other three aren't here today. Um, I'll give you a very quick overview of what Tonic is, because uh, I'm sure many folks on the call saw Llama Index and they joined, they might not know who Tonic is. So Tonic is a startup that's been around for five and a half years. We have primarily been in the synthetic data space. We take production databases and data sets and create de-identified and synthetic versions of them, which you can use in your lower environments for testing and development without risking your customer's privacy. But more recently, we've begun offering tools for data scientists playing and working in the generative AI space. And that's why we're here today. I'm gonna to be showing you how to use Tonic Validate, our RAG evaluation framework, in conjunction with lo local models powered by Llama Index. And speaking of Llama Index, Jerry, I'll hand it over to you now. Hey everyone, uh, it's great to be here. Jerry from, uh, you know, co-founder and CEO of Llama Index. Um, Llama Index, uh, for those of you who don't know, is a data framework for building LLM applications over your data. Um, and so, you know, we have a rich ecosystem enabling developers to connect their unstructured, semi-structured and structured data to language models to build various types of applications. And a very popular type of application these days is RAG or Retrieval Augmented Generation. Um, and a lot of that revolves around end user use cases of question answering, um, structured data extraction and conversational chat. So today, you know, the topic will primarily be around how do you build RAG with local models? Um, and then also how do you properly evaluate and test this? Uh, and local models especially has been something that's been pretty top of mind for a lot of developers, especially as you know, like a lot of the popular LMs these days require API access. So if you're hitting like uh, uh, OpenAI or Anthropic or Gemini, you're basically making an API request to an external API to run, uh, you know, inference and then get back the results. Uh, and for a lot of like enterprise settings, this uh, tends to raise a little bit of like discomfort, especially just around like data privacy, security, those types of things. So without further ado, um, yeah, let's get into it. Um, yeah. These are the main participants. I realize I probably should have done that uh, like uh, two minutes ago, but that's okay. Um, these are our faces. And um, yeah, Adam, I, or actually I'll, 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 I'll take this. So in terms of like, why do you want to use local models? Um, there's like a few reasons, you know, um, and I think the Tonic folks put, put some stuff on here in terms of like the, the main um, good points are like basically data privacy. Like you want to make sure that the data is, is co-located with uh, like your, your model. And so um, that, that way you're not actually sending data to an external API um, with the risk that, of course, like an external server could also uh, potentially, you know, the data might be intercepted. Uh, it could be stored by that third party, right? And so for a lot of very highly data sensitive applications, you might want to, you want to make sure that it never leaves uh, your, your system. Um, there's also just like offline access, which is very related. Like sometimes you just want to be able to run applications on the edge uh, without necessarily accessing the internet. And actually there's uh, quite a few very interesting applications that fall into this domain. Um, and actually some of it includes like embedded devices and those types of things where you can basically just like run, imagine running a local LLM and imagine you might be in a situation where you don't even have internet access. You can't, you know, get like Wi-Fi or cellular signal, um, but you still want to use a language model to help you run computations and processings. Um, a, a third big reason is customization. So with local models, um, you can basically fine tune the model to try to give uh, to, to, to basically have more control over the weights of the model. Um, instead of using like a, a, one of these out of the box, like black box systems like OpenAI or Anthropic, where you basically don't really have control or ownership over the end model, 
Uh, one of the advantages of a lot of these local models is that their license allow you, allows you to basically fine tune and own the weights. Um, and this is appealing for a variety of reasons. One is just you're able to continue to optimize it. Two is you just have ownership and, and IP over the model itself, as opposed to depending on a third party. And Adam, feel free to jump in if there's any other thoughts that you want to add. Yeah, I was I was going to share one additional consideration, um, and and maybe you you just briefly touched on it, but I think it can be relatively important for a lot of use cases is managing cost. Um, if you can develop local models that that you know provide a quality of answer answer similar to the 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 large you know language models that we all know like GPT four, um, then really you know you can get some really nice benefits from that. Um, you know, I would actually love to hear from the audience here. Um, so we have this chat available at the at the bottom of the, the Zoom screen. Um, just, you know, we're interested, folks. Like, chime in. Like, you know, why are you here today? I would love to hear of these three things. Like, what's the most important to you and why you're using local models? And if there's some other reason that Jerry and I did not think of, you know, just put it in the chat. We'd love to learn more. Yeah, and I think related to that, we see a lot of users these days running like seven billion models. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of interest in these smaller models that are a bit more task specific. And especially if you can get them to perform just as well as, you know, your GPT-4s uh, for your specific use case, then I think that's a very uh, powerful uh, valid proposition because then you basically are able to run this much more cheaply. You're able to own the weights and it, it can also potentially be much faster than depending on a third party API. Are, are those models, Jerry, that are typically like uh, like fine tuned on specific domains of data? Is that what you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, I think you know a, a lot of people are still tinkering around with these use cases. But yes, like you, you, if you are able to take a seven billion model, uh, the, they're increasingly starting to just work well out of the box, like the the Mistrals and and like um, like uh, the, there's a bunch more that just came out and somehow it was just slipping on top of my head. Um, but yes, like the, these models are increasing in reasoning capabilities, even the smaller ones. Um, and then you can, of course, fine tune it on your own domain. Just chiming in quickly, the, the chat was disabled. I've now enabled it. Um, and we do have a comment that came in by way of the Q&A, but feel free to chat to us as well in the webinar chat. Local models can be cheaper depending on your maintenance costs. I think that's also echoing some of what you're saying. Yeah, exactly. Um, OK. Great, and so here we'll just go through um, how to set up a local model with Llama Index. Um, and so, again, Llama Index is a general orchestration framework that a lot that has you know hundreds of different integrations across like data loaders, LLMs, embeddings, vector stores. So part of it is just a rich ecosystem of different things you can pull together to build applications like like uh, Rag. Um, and so in this case, you know, we'll use a certain uh, library for setting up local models, specifically Olama. Um, and then, of course, in the second section, um, Adam will be talking about evaluating local mo uh, RAG quality with uh, Tonic Validate. Um, so these two combined give you both a general framework for uh, application development, as well as an evaluation framework for basically uh, experimentation, optimization, and testing. So Jerry, I'll, I'll take care of that slide. Yeah, once the, yeah, that's great. Great. Yeah, and and so I, I, that's probably that's probably uh, jump ahead in um, in just a bit. But first, uh, I'll show you just um, how do you actually set up uh, local rag with uh, with Llama Ducks. So first, we'll go to Olama. Right, Olama is a very very popular um, library these days, or not library, just like an overall tool for basically running a local model that runs directly on your laptop. Um, and so it's basically built on top of like Llama CPP. But um, what you can do is you can basically download all these different local models that have come out recently. Um, so this includes uh, Gemma, which is you know the recent models that came out from Google, um, who've also come out with like the Gemini Pro. Um, this also includes you know Llama two. Mistral, uh, Mistral, and, and all these other models. What I can show you is how to actually run Mistral on my MacBook. Um, we're in this demo, we're actually going to use Llama 2 70B, uh, which will not fit on my laptop, um, but you know, will probably require you to have some sort of like GPU access. Um, and so for any of these models, it's, it's actually just really convenient because what they've done is they made it a, uh, a very uh, self-serve experience where you can just download, you know, the uh, Olama on, onto your laptop. Uh, and then all you have to do is click into one of these models and do um, Olama run Mistral, right? And if you're able to do something like that, um, you basically get back like a chat interface that you can uh, easily query uh, with any sort of conversation and get back a response. 
Um, there's also, they have a client SDK, which we integrate with, uh, which, you know, this is basically what our Olama wrapper does is that now, you know, not only can you use it just as an end user to interact with it in the terminal, you can also build uh, applications with it as well. So pivoting back to the notebook itself. Um, and, and, and so this is the main notebook that we'll show. Uh, and it will basically walk through all the steps of first, like using a local model, um, using the LAM index integration for that, uh, building a basic RAG pipeline and explaining a little bit about what the steps are. And then Adam will take over the uh, piece of how do you actually, you know, evaluate and run this and test it and optimize it. So because we're trying to set up a local RAG system, um, and a RAG basically consists, requires two types of models. It requires both an LLM as well as an embedding model. Um, and so we want local models for both, right? Like we want both the embedding model and the LLM to not make external API calls. So for local embedding models, we're going to use uh, the BG small model. Um, it's a local model that, you know, is, is probably one of the state of the art uh, embedding models on Hugging Face that's local um, and that you can just download. And, um, you know, this is by the, I forgot the specific name, but it's like the Beijing Academy of like AI, um, et cetera. And so um, they are actually coming out with a new model soon. But in the meantime, this is relatively state of the art. So we'll download BG small um, and B1.5. That's the model ID on Hugging Face. And you see that, you know, to use it with Llama Index, we'll just import our Hugging Face embedding class. Um, this is a general Hugging Face wrapper, which allows you to plug into pretty much any Hugging Face model. It will download the model locally and basically uh, allow you to use it uh, as an embedding model. An embedding model, right, takes in a piece of text and then generates an embedding vector. Um, and so that embedding vector is just a list of numbers. The other part here that we'll show is sorry, just jumping in with a quick couple of questions that came in through the chat, asking mm -hmm. about if um, we can access these notebooks, if audience members afterwards, and if they can get resources used in this session. Yeah, maybe yeah. Uh, we can share the the public. Link I'll, I'll drop a link to the Jupyter notebook um, in a few minutes. Awesome. Yes, yeah, I just loaded this up in Jupyter Lab so we can in case it like overflowed. Um, so in terms of uh, like. The, like there's this other settings object in Llama Index, which is basically just like a convenience uh, global config uh, type of thing, where if you uh, set uh, properties on the settings object, this means that you don't need to pass like an embedding model or the LLM or other things through to all of our other abstractions. And so this basically acts as a global config module. And here we set settings on embedding model. The next piece here is setting up Olama. Um, and so as we talked about, uh, Olama is a very popular tool for running local models. Um, and so we're going to use Olama, Llama 270B. Um, basically, the bigger, the higher the number of weights, the better the model tends to be at being able to follow instructions, uh, reason, and actually follow like more complicated prompts. Uh, we find that like uh, smaller models tend to struggle a little bit more with that, right? Just because they have fewer parameters. But even then, you know, it is getting better over time. Um, this is something that I cannot run on my laptop. Uh, you are going to need uh, GPUs, um, but luckily all the outputs uh, are already there for you to basically see what's going on. Um, and so if you take a look at um, the like how to set this up, first is you can basically connect to an Olama URL. By default, uh, it's hosted locally, but you can specify this URL to whatever server is running Olama. Um, and then you specify the model hash, right? And here we specify um, llama 2 70 b chat. Uh, the overall integration is in llama um, This is just an integration package you can install. Um, it's well maintained. And this allows you to interface with any Olama model. Uh, and then you set a request timeout right here. The next piece here is now that we've defined the embedding and LLM models, uh, we can start building a basic RAG pipeline. Um, and so for our data, we'll be using a collection of just Paul Graham essays, and we'll be asking questions about these essays. Um, if you want to take a look at what these essays look like, uh, I think, oh yeah, we, we basically loaded like um, a lot of different essays into different TXT files here in this overall um, offline dump. And so if you take a look at any of these essays, you see the, or they are just big blobs of text of varying lengths, right? And so some of these are relatively short. Some of these are a lot longer. That's great. All, these, these essays are also available in the GitHub link that I provided in the chat. 
yeah, all all this is, by the way, is just a local copy of the of the GitHub repo. So to basically load in all these documents, all you have to do is import what we call a simple directory reader. This is basically just a data loader that's bundled with Llama index. You know, we have 150 plus data loaders, but this is by far the most popular one where you just specify a directory or a single file, um, in this case, a directory, and you just call load data. And then once you do that, it loads in every single document in the directory um, as a separate document object. Um, and so we load in these documents and then now they exist as just like raw document objects of different lengths. And what we wanna do is now we want to put them into a vector index. Um, so this is the data ingestion piece of setting up a RAG pipeline. Um, and in LOM index to set this up, we make this pretty simple. Uh, you just import a vector store index and then you call vector store index from documents uh, on the documents. What's happening here is you take in these documents and under the hood, it's taking these documents and chunking them into various text chunks, adding an embedding onto each text chunk and putting it into an in-memory store. Um, of course, you can choose to integrate this and put this into a vector database. We integrate with like 40 to 50 plus vector databases. Um, and in this case, we're just uh, demonstrating a simple in-memory vector database. Um, and this will basically get stored and give you back an index object that you can then use to, to query over. So now that we set up the index, uh, we just want to set up like the query interface over this index so we can you know, build out that RAG setup. And the way RAG works is it's really two stages, right? Um, you first do retrieval over you know, your, your vector index or your vector database. And then to fetch back the fetch the relevant context uh, given you know your your input question, and then after you do retrieval, you want to do synthesis. So given the retrieved context from the vector database, you want to feed it to the LLM to synthesize a response. This is captured by this function over here called get llama response. Um, and so first we'll define query engine equals index as query engine, and this will give you back like a query interface over the index. Um, the query engine actually basically just contains both retrieval and synthesis under the hood. And so in LAM index, we make it very easy to basically define uh, a query engine over any source of data that you set up. Um, and then after you set up the source of data, you just have to do query engine dot query, right? Um, to, to get back a response. This under the hood again, does both retrieval and synthesis uh, in one line of code. And the response is basically a response object. Um, and you can stringify it to get back the, uh, or, or get back like the, the, the uh, response attribute itself to get back like the actual text. But a response object contains both the final generated answer as well as the source nodes. Um, the source nodes are the like retrieved sources from the vector database. So you can actually see like the actual like source text that um, like the LM used to try to make its decision. Um, and then the response itself is just uh, the, the final generated answer. And for uh, basically allowing us to plug into Tonic Validate later on, um, we return this in a dictionary format. So we just generate the LM answer as well as the LM context list. And then the next piece here is, um, you know, let's, given that we've defined these functions, let's try asking some sample questions to WAM index. Um, so we, we load in some sample questions to ask Llama Index about these polygram essays. And you can see um, here we load in a question and answer list. Um, and I think it's this one. And this is basically just a big JSON of different questions. Um, and you can see that here we've actually defined uh, both the input, um, but also, you know, like the ground truth um, answer and, and outputs. So like, you know, what makes Sam Allman a good founder? This is the ground truth answer. And then here's like the reference article as well as the reference text. And so we can, for instance, you know, load in, we can load in this file um, and for each of these print it out. Um, and here, you know, we just see what the ground truth uh, answers are for each question. And then, you know, let's take one of the questions um, and, and try to actually, you know, run it through in our RAG setup uh, to just take a look at what the answer is. Um, so if we take a look at, you know, uh, or if you if we input the question, what makes Sam Allman a good founder, and we input it into this RAG pipeline, 
uh, we're able to get back this response um, right here. It's a lot more detailed than this answer. Um, so, but in any case, um, you're able to get back like a response and then you're also able to get back uh, the list of contexts that it retrieved from. Um, and so if you take a look at LLM context list, um, this is the set of retrieved contexts. So you basically take a look at the sources of the, like the, the actual documents, right? Like the document snippets that were used to generate this answer. And you can see it's a pretty decently sized blob of text. There's, there's two retrieved texts. Great. I'm going to take a quick pause there. I'm happy to pass it over to Adam or answer questions anytime. So most of the questions coming in so far are, are asking for links to the um, uh, to the, to the uh, Jupyter Notebook. Um, and I, I put it in the chat, but the chat seems to be a little funky. So for folks that aren't seeing things in the chat, um, just search on GitHub, Tonic underscore validate. Uh, you'll pull up the Tonic validate repository where you can find a link to the Jupyter Notebook as well as the example text from Paul Graham and um, other you know, useful resources. Um, Jerry is kindly doing it for us. Thank you, Jerry. And I'll also include, yeah. um, we'll be sending out a recording of the webinar sometime tomorrow and I can include the link to the notebook there too. Excellent. And, and Jerry, you got a question from uh, Nicholas. Are you able to see that? I can, um, I can read it out. So oh, it yeah. Too. Yeah. It's, uh, the question is, so basically the LLM will use the retrieve vectors and use that as a context for the answer? Yeah, exactly. So it's basically like the way RAG works is two <laughs> stages. Um, it's a retrieval step and then a synthesis step. And so um, you first do retrieval, which is not using the LLM at all, but using the embeddings to fetch some relevant context. Um, and then yes, the LLM will use the relevant or the retrieve context uh, you you basically put it all into the input prompt of the L one, and you get back an answer. And and Nicholas, in in case it's not clear, like the benefit of doing this, and oftentimes like the reason for doing it is because the amount of data you have um, won't fit into like you know the context window of a large language model. Like you know you guys, have, I'm sure have heard of things like you know GPT four Turbo thirty two k, right? So with GPT four, I can at most send approximately. 32,000 words in my prompt. So if, you're, if your questions are spanning documents that, that contain more than 32,000 words, you can't you know, basically send the LLM all of your documents and then start asking questions because the LLM can't fit all of it you know, into, its, um, into its mind. I, I can't think of a better word there. So what the RAG system does, it basically searches through your documents and based on the question you're asking, just retrieves the most relevant documents so that we can fit those into the context window. You know, it really just becomes a game of, let's put the most relevant things in the context window and discard everything else. And then the LLM can like basically perform at its highest level. Like that, that's the name of the game here. And that's like the whole reason that one would use a RAG system. Yep, that's Great. a good answer. Actually, Jerry, did you see in the news the, the new Gemini models from Google that are gonna have 1.5 million tokens in the context window? Yeah, we put out a blog post on this last week, um, like just talking about long context rag. And it's a very interesting discussion. You know, I think um, a lot of people are going back and forth on like what is the role of rag with long context windows. Um, I think in general for um, any sort of enterprise knowledge base that typically is at least in the gigabytes of data, uh, you would absolutely still need some sort of retrieval mechanism. Um, but I do think long context models make it much easier for you to just upload like five to 10 PDFs into, you know, you can do this in cloud too. Like if you take a look at cloud three or Gemini Pro, just upload some small folder of PDFs and just start asking questions over it. Yes, exactly. Speaking of questions, Speaking of questions we got another question uh, in the chat. Uh, can there be another process in the pipeline which ranks the retrieved vectors, which are more likely to answer the question more precisely? It's like a pretty yes, clear, um, yeah. Yeah, I, that's actually, I mean, if you're familiar with retrieval, um, there's usually like, uh, as you get slightly more advanced than raw retrieval, there's usually like a re-ranking stage after. Um, and so the retrieval step itself can actually be pretty complex, but also pulls a lot from just best practices and, and IR. So 
yeah, typically you do some sort of dense embedding based retrieval, and then you do a re-ranking pass after. And these days there's actually a healthy ecosystem of different companies putting out good like re-ranking models. Um, this is everything from Colbert to, um, to, to Cohere re-rank, to Gina re-rank, to a lot of these like open source uh, science transformer re-rankers. Are, Jerry, I read like, I can't remember, I think it was a blog article the other day. Um, it was talking about re-rank via like knowledge graphs. Um, are any of the technologies that you just listed using like knowledge graphs as an approach or are those just not in the market yet? Um, I don't think those are using all the graphs. I mean, these are typically just models. Um, so these models are just like ish models that take in like a question, uh, like a context. And, you know, that like inherently by using a model, it's going to be slower than like, um, like dot products, which is what vector similarity is. Right. But by using a model, you basically are able to more finely rank like a given uh, context, uh, like basically whether a context is relevant to a question. Yep. And and yeah, okay. Lambda does have re-ranking models. We 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 have a we have a lot of them actually. Yeah, Excellent. that's great. Okay, um, Jerry, I think I can take over the screen share now. Oh, I'm sorry, Kiara. Go just ahead. just one more question before before yeah. But as you as you're switching over the screen share, I'll ask this one more question, which came through. I think it's really interesting. Uh, talking about performance, what would you recommend to use for a rag system for law documents? What vector D vectors DB is the current state of art? Um, Pinecone is suggested. For, for law documents. Mm -hmm. um, I think in general, it doesn't really matter what vector database you use because vector databases don't compete on like performance. Uh, like typically like bomb index, like we can give you algorithms for showing you how to model different data uh, data sources well. Um, vector databases don't compete. I, I mean, they don't compete on accuracy. They, they, they compete on like, like systems level stuff, like performance scalability, whether you can deploy it on premise. So if you're just using, like, it actually doesn't really matter what, what database you use. But in terms of a RAG system, typically I just start off with something basic, you know, like as we talked about, uh, dense, like just throw in your text into uh, uh, like bomb index, do the basic stuff, maybe add a re-ranker, or see if that works well enough. And then if that doesn't work, we have like hundreds of different guides, basically going very in depth at different stages of the process to show you how to optimize your RAG system. Um, but I think that would typically come at a later stage. Okay, and there's another follow-up question to this. Uh, should I use a Q&A open LLM or will a model from OpenAI or Bedrock be better? Um, we're we're going to talk about that in the next um, portion all right. of the webinar. But no, Gary, answer yeah. too. I want to hear you say no, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean, I guess the whole point of this webinar is try to use local models. And and honestly, like if you're just trying to build something for question answering, local models do fine. I think it's only when you're trying to do something that's very heavily, like you're trying to make this thing automatically reason over multiple steps, like make it an agent, like an autonomous agent that can do a lot of things. That's where local models currently struggle. I would say um, one, one benefit of going just straight to open AI or go here or you know any of the, the cloud models is there's like it is a little easier to get started and to get set up um if, if privacy is not the concern um then like you know and you just want to try it out quickly like you can just start asking questions to open ai basically immediately whereas in the local models there's there's setup required you're gonna have to go provision hardware you're gonna have to get a gpu you're gonna have to get it running in the network and the firewall and all these things right um, so if you're just trying to get a taste of it, like, you know, open AI is a, is a fine way to go, assuming there's no restrictions on you sending data, you know, to that cloud. Um, so something to consider. I find a lot of Ponix enterprise customers are using um, Azure open AI. So they're, they're using open AI models deployed in their Azure environments. Uh, and they already have, you know, contracts and, and DPAs and BAA signed with Azure. So it's all, you know, above the board and, and you know, the data sharing is allowed. Uh, and that gives them access to basically, you know, top tier, you know, non-local models, which is also nice. Um, uh, Avi, I'll, I'll answer that one, Avi. Um, if you have questions for me specifically, you're welcome to reach out. That GitHub repo that we shared, you know, tonic underscore validate, just drop drop a question in in the issues in that GitHub, uh, and, and then we can we can chat. Um, and and, and I'm, I'm sure Llama Index also has many ways to to get in touch and I'll let Jerry answer that or, um, yeah. Oh yeah, we'd have a, a Discord in GitHub, so feel free to drop it. Excellent. Yeah, man, we need to set up a Discord too. I feel like every time I want to do it, I get distracted, but that's a great way to connect with everybody. Okay, let me share my screen now. 
Okay. Kiara, what can you see? Can you see my um, presentation? Yes, I can. Yes. Great. All right. I'll go in this. Oh, man. I, okay. I think slideshow is what I do. Hey, all right. So um, for this next part, we're going to take the local models that Jerry has set up using Llama Index, and we're going to evaluate the output, right? Like we've set up the models. They seem to be working. But the question now is, okay, well, what's the quality? Like how well are these models performing? Um, are the answers they're giving, are, 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 are they valid? And can I actually use them in production? Uh, and then you might have, you know, once you answer those questions, you might have other questions like, okay, well, I'm going to be making changes to my application over time. How do I track the quality of the answers with those changes, right? Like how do I kind of like in an automated way through CICD evaluate my RAG application? You know, on the engineering side, when you ignore LLMs for a second, you know, th this is a very well trodden path test automation, unit tests, et cetera. But when you throw an LLM into the mix where the answers can be non-deterministic and the answer quality is subjective, you need a new set of tools. And Tonic Validate is one approach that you can take to evaluating your LLM-based application. All right, so I'll start with some high levels. What makes a good RAG system? All right, well, you know, does the answer match? Is it hallucinating? Um, is there information in the answer that was not retrieved from the context? That's a good signal that, hey, a hallucination is happening. Is the retrieved context relevant to the question, you know, being asked? You know, questions like this come up when determining answer quality. Or maybe I think um, one of our, our um, viewers today, Avi, said he's working with legal documents, right? The answers that you expect out of legal documents oftentimes won't be subjective. Our customers that work with, you know, RAG systems based on legal documents, their RAG systems are, are giving precise answers. What's the contract start date here? Give me the terms here, et cetera. These are supposed to be non-deterministic, non-subjective answers. How do you evaluate these things for accuracy? So these are kind of like all the questions that one thinks about when evaluating a RAG system or just evaluating LLM output in general. All right, so Tonic Validate is a solution here. It comes in two parts. There is an open source component that anyone can go use today you know, we've already provided the GitHub link, but it's called Tonic underscore validate. You can check out that code or rather pip install it via Python and begin evaluating your um, RAG systems and LLM applications. Um, it works pretty simply. You basically give us a callback into your RAG system and then a set of questions whose answers you want us to evaluate the quality of. And then the library returns a set of metrics for you. You know, basically we can evaluate between like five and I think about 20 metrics at the moment per question. And then you can see, you know, okay, well, you know, how, how is each question faring? And then how does it fare over time? That, that's essentially how it works. And then there's a second component to Tonic Validate, which is a UI. You can go create an account today at validate.tonic.ai. And then using the open source SDK, you can send metrics that you collect up into the UI so that you can track changes over time, so that you can kind of view trends, and so that you can integrate it with various GitHub actions that we have so that it's easy to kind of like track things via a CI CD process. And I'll kind of go over all of that briefly. So let's get started. Great, I've already kind of talked to this. Let's get into the Jupyter Notebook. All right. Um, great, so uh, this is the same notebook that, that Jerry had been working with. And again, it is available here at tonic underscore validate. Just click on examples, go to the Llama Index webinar, and then you'll find the Jupyter Notebook. Um, all right, going back, uh, let's go to our notebook. Cool. So I'm going to kind of walk you through this code, and I'll, I'll do it relatively quickly, though, because I also want to hop into the UI for a bit. So Adam, you're going to you zoom in just a little bit just for the audience. Oh, absolutely. Um, let us, how is that? Is that better? Maybe one more. One more. How are we looking now? No. Good. You know what I'm going to do, Jerry? Let me let me stop sharing. Actually, I'm going to not share such a wide screen. That was uh that was a newbie mistake that I just made. So let me share um my window that is a lot narrower, and then you tell me if I'm looking a little better. How's that? Yeah, that's good. That's good. Okay, sorry about that, folks. Jerry, thank you for calling that out. Um, okay, so we're picking up where Jerry left off. I'm going to import some, um, you know, classes and um, utilities from the Tonic Validate uh, Python package. Um, primarily, I'm going to kind of iterate through the the set the the question set that we have for evaluation, and I'm going to create what's called a benchmark object. 
A benchmark is a set of questions and an optional set of human generated answers. These are ground truth answers. Now it can be cumbersome to create a reference answer for every question. So in fact, most of the metrics that we use within Tonic Validate do not require you to provide an answer. We can actually evaluate the quality of your rag without having ground, ground truth human generated answers. But for the demo today, we actually do have reference answers for every question. So once you kind of, you know, create your question answer list into this benchmark object, we can go import the validate score, which is where, you know, most of the magic happens. Uh, and then we can um, run the actual scoring. So, you know, Jerry mentioned there's, there's two models that play in building a RAG system, right? There, there's the model for the embedding, and then there's the, the model that's actually that helping you come up with an answer. Well, when you add evaluation in, you get a third model. We are actually going to be using a large language model to generate our scores, to assess the quality of RAG generated answers. So for today's demo, we're actually going to be using that same local model as what we're going to call our critic, the thing that's going to generate our scores and tell us, hey, how is the RAG system doing on a per question basis? Uh, you can set up that right here by passing in a model evaluator uh, parameter. And here we're going to be using LAMA 2 70 billion. One uh, line that I actually left out that I'm going to put back in just for clarity, because I know folks are going to go try this at home. You will also need to specify the URL to your OLAMA model. Uh, it's a bit confusing, but the environment variable that you use to set this is actually called the OpenAI base URL. Um, don't worry about that. OpenAI is not involved here at all. This is just kind of the URL that we use um, for basically referencing all models. Um, certainly, that environment variable could be renamed. Um, if, if it bothers you so much, please go file an issue in GitHub, uh, and you know we can get on it right away. So. Um, once we do this, we're going to go send the questions that we have in our test set um, to the OLAMA model, and the OLAMA model is going to generate metrics for us. Not all of the metrics that we have actually require an LLM to evaluate. For example, for like legal use cases, um, for legal document use cases, you know, sometimes the answers you want are very factual and straightforward, like when was the start of this contract? In that case, we have metrics that can actually just do exact string comparisons or regex matches or substring matches. So we can do things without LLMs, but you know, many of our more useful metrics do involve using a large language model to evaluate. So once the scoring is complete, we get this object, a response score. Uh, I'm gonna print it out for you below just by kind of converting it into a handy data frame that we can print. So the data frame basically gives you a column of each of the questions being asked in the test, and then three of the metrics that we were evaluating, answer similarity, augmentation precision, and answer consistency. Um, answer similarity, which is what I'm going to primarily focus on today, basically takes the answer generated by the RAG system and compares it to the human generated ground truth answer. Answer similarity is actually the only metric we have that requires a human generated reference answer. The others do not. For example, these two metrics do not need that. You can see that in general, we're doing okay. Um, the scoring is from zero to five, where five is the best. And we have lots of fours and fives, but we also have some twos. And we're going to kind of dig in to all of this in a moment. Now, Adam, oh, yeah, yeah, no, I a question. So yes. I'm seeing some like errors in the in the section above. Uh, could you explain to why that's, you know, kind of talk to why that's happening? Oh, sure. Um, it looks like it's happening, uh, like running repeats of the same question asked or something. No, I, I think this is because some, each of our metrics here, you know, I'll, I'll go here. Um, and, and Ethan on my side can kind of chime in in the chat if he's got um, some more detailed answers to show. But you know, here's a subset of the metrics that we provide. And each of these metrics requires different inputs. And sometimes the, um, the, the, the information that we give to the validate scorer doesn't have all of the information needed for a given question. So you know, we're basically saying to the scorer, give us all the metrics you can for each question. And those log statements can be saying, hey, we actually can't provide you an answer similarity score for this question because you didn't give us a reference answer. Got it. So that, that's, you're, you're gonna see stuff like that. It's all by design. Um, and what you'll see in the data frame, for example, is that you're getting you know, um, NAN outputs when we can't provide a metric or a score rather for that specific metric. Uh, I, actually, in this case, it's not due to that. It's because um, Llama, even at the 70B model, Llama 2 typically has like issue with following um, instructions sometimes. So what ends up happening is if you ask it like uh, state true or false for this question, it will sometimes instead of answering the question, it will just continue writing the initial prompt. Oh. Asking it. 
So that's what's happening there. It happened a few times. Oh, got it. Very interesting. Ethan, thank you. And I, it should be very clear to the audience who did all of the work leading up to the presentation today. And that was Ethan. So thank you, Ethan. Um, this is not a problem I've seen with our, um, when we use um, open AI models for evaluation. Have you ever seen it with open AI, Ethan? No, I, I thought at first I thought it was actually that there was some like error in logging and it was restating the question. But when I searched through it, it was literally just it was literally writing down, please respond with either true or false from the that's what it got was it. literally the response. So yeah, got I haven't it. seen it before with open AI though. But it's interesting. Kind of so thank you, Ethan. So for, for folks that didn't exactly get all of that, you know, we generate our own prompts so that the so that an LLM can kind of evaluate um, you know, answer quality. And in those, some of those prompts, you know, some of our metrics are true, false, like yes, no. So the prompts will say, please answer with, you know, a yes or no, so that we can, you know, basically determine, you know, the score. And for this local model, it wasn't exactly understanding the prompt. Uh, and therefore, it wasn't responding with the true, false that we needed. Whereas that has not happened before when using, like, you know, the, um, the cloud large language models like OpenAI, like the ones OpenAI provides. Okay, so everything I've done up till now is available in our open source um, uh, solution. So you can go pip install tonic validate and you can do everything I've just done, including creating your scores. You can then take these scores and do whatever you like with them, right? You, you can send them to your own metric service. You can store them in a CSV. You can track it over time, what have you. You can take it a step further though. You can upload your metrics to the tonic validate web server. And you can do that with this line here. You simply um, just pass in your project ID and the result of the scorer. And then we will render these scores for you in our UI and track them over time for you, okay? Uh, I'll show you what that looks like. So here I am on the Validate homepage. I've already created my account. It's available at validate.conic.ai. Uh, I'm gonna go over this webinar project that we've already created where we sent scores from this evaluation. Um, we're gonna focus on the most recent run, but quickly I'll just kind of show you the UI. This is showing you the overall average of scores over time and how it's trending up. You can look at specific metrics to see how they vary over time as well. If you go into an individual run, which is one scoring session, uh, you can get a more detailed view of what's happening. So for example, let's look at this first question here. What is a good way in which we can help incentivize entrepreneurship through legislation? The reference answer, the human generated answer is create a visa for startup founders, right? Now the LLM response or rather the, the RAG response is significantly more long-winded, you know, kind of what Jerry had pointed out earlier. Um, it also shows the context here. So what's going on? Oh, and sorry, and down here, we can see the kind of like the score for this metric. The answer similarity came in at a two, which is relatively low. Uh, in this situation, what happened is, and you can see this by looking at the context, the context retrieved was not super relevant to the question being asked. Um, you know, one reason that can happen uh, is because the embeddings, the local embeddings that we used, uh, unfortunately, didn't do a, a good job at, you know, embedding both the question and the knowledge store and then ultimately finding a, a, a dot product similarity between them. You know, that, that could be one reason this is happening. Okay. But we ended up with a low score. And, and the, the scoring here is correct. Like maybe a two is a bit generous. You know, I, I would say maybe it's between a one and a two out of five, I would say. Right. But Tonic Validate points this out to us. That's good. Um, another situation that can come up with local models. Um, let me find this other question here. So um, question, let's say my startup hires a bunch of people from MIT Sloan. What might be a problem about this? Well, the reference answer is you need people with technical skills. And if you hire them from MIT Sloan, you, they might not be super technical because Sloan is MIT's business school. You know, this question is meant to be a little bit tricky, right? We hear MIT, you think technical, but oh, it's the business school, right? So um, in this situation, uh, it turns out that the context retrieve is actually not great, but that's not my, the main problem here. The answer similarity is relatively high. It's a four out of five, but look at the answer. The answer is there, it's important to note there is no direct reference to MIT Sloan in the given context. Um, and then it goes on to just give a very generic answer that's super not related to the reference answer. So then why is he giving such a high answer similar similarity score? I mean, a four out of five is quite good. And it's because of the, um, the LLM model we're using for evaluation. Olama in this situation did not do a super great job computing the answer similarity score. 
Um, this, this is a problem that we see. It happens with like the large cloud models as well, um, but it seems to be a bit more prominent at the moment with um, local models where the its ability to kind of assess answer similarity is a bit weaker than, you know, the counterparts available from like OpenAI and others. So another thing to call out. Another pitfall that you could find um, is when the context is in, the context is um, correct, but the answer itself is bad. Meaning, you know, we gave the large language model everything it needs to give us back a good answer, but it fails to do so. And I'll point out in this in, in this data set, we weren't able to find any examples of that. Meaning, when we're able to give the local model good context, it does give back a good score, and I, and that's really important. Um, Got a couple right. of questions for you. Um, sure. Let's see. How do you trace the source of the retrieved context? Uh, this is provided. This is provided to us by the RAG application. So when we do our scoring, I can show you here. Um, we essentially are just when, when when we do our scoring, we basically pass in the the set of questions that we want to evaluate, and then this function. This function is calling in to Llama Index or to whatever your RAG application is. And this function is returning the answer provided by the RAG application and a list of contexts that it used to generate that answer. So we're basically getting all of this information from the RAG system itself. And then we kind of package it all up into this like, you know, response scores um, object. And that's what we upload to the UI. Then there was another question that came in earlier and uh, a little bit earlier. So we may be missing some of the context. If if the question asker is still here, let chime in with more context if you have it. Do you handle cases when there are relationships between attributes and maintaining variations in the data set while generating synthetic data? I, I think they're asking about our other offerings related yeah. to synthetic data. Uh, the answer is yes. Um, and you, you can go to our website, Tonic.ai, to learn more and also to reach out to us and to create a free trial account if you'd like to, you know, see for yourself. But we're uh, um, we're not going to get into more details in this webinar, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, and right. then a follow-up to the question that I had asked you previously about the retrieved context, it, how do we trace it is the specific question. How do we, how do we trace it? Well, uh, so are, are we, you guys have... like the audience of we... it? Oh, Jerry, please go ahead. Yeah, we, we have... Um... Uh, in, in general, we, we have a lot of integrations with uh, general, you know, uh, like we have a lot of callbacks within Llama Index, which will log events. And then these directly integrate with uh, providers that provide like observability solutions. Um, and so this is, there's like certain tools that allow you to basically visualize just like traces as you run through, say like a query engine or anything that's arbitrarily complicated. You can see like the individual like retrieval step, the prompt, the LLM, all that stuff under the hood. Um, and so this stuff has become increasingly popular in, in the past year or so as people are building LLM apps and we integrate with pretty much all the observability providers. Uh, and of course, you know, if, if Tonic creates like an observability as well, like we'll, we'll integrate with them as well. But yeah, a lot of this stuff is in our docs. And the question asker provided more context saying, the reason I ask is the retrieved contexts were very truthful in the earlier examples compared to the responses. The, so the PR, please repeat that. And the retrieved contexts were very truthful in the earlier examples as compared to the responses. Right. So, you know, I, I, I'll, I'm i kind of going to interpret this question a bit differently than Jerry did. I What I thought was meant, but maybe I'm incorrect, is, okay, given this context that you're showing me, how can I see, you know, which documents it came from in my knowledge store? Um, may, maybe that was being asked as well to what Jerry answered. Um, in that case, that is something that, like, I'm sure Llama Index provides that functionality. Um, and it's also something that you can kind of incorporate into Tonic Validate because the um, the API calls that we have that kind of upload metrics to your um, to our web server um, are, are very like generic in nature and allow for you to add additional information into the payload as well that we can render in the UI. So you can add additional information about provenance of context if needed. Um, great. So hopefully, hopefully between our two answers, we have answered that question. Yeah. Um, excellent. The last thing that I'm, I'm going to say something just very quickly, uh, being able to validate a RAC or evaluate a RAG system, you know, in a Jupyter notebook is great. Oftentimes though, you want to automate this process 
and integrate it into your development practices. So as you're making code changes to your application, you want to see how those code changes are affecting your RAG application and how they affect answer quality. If that's true, then I would encourage you. Oh, where did it go? Um, you know, I would encourage you um, to check out some of our GitHub actions. So we'll view this one on the marketplace. This GitHub action, which you can install into your code base with a single click and then a minor you know, YAML config file, will essentially run tonic validate every time you merge a branch into your master or main branch, and then send the results to the tonic validate UI so you can keep track of what's going on. So for example, I've done that with one of my projects. Um, if I go here, I can see how my quality is changing over time. And in fact, as I'm going through this, if I click on data points, I can actually correlate it back to specific Git commits. So if I see a big dip in quality all of a sudden, I can just go straight to that Git commit to figure out what happened. And that's all powered by these GitHub action. And of course, by the Tonic Validate SDK. Uh, and this is also, also something that of course, you can incorporate into your Llama index development as well. All right, um, Kiara, that's it for me. So what I'll do, I'm gonna kind of scroll to the bottom here. Um, I'll give a quick summary of everything and, and then we'll open it for additional questions for Jerry and I. So wrapping up, Llama Index allows you to use local models to build out your own fully private RAG system. Tonic Validate then allows you to evaluate the quality of your RAG system with private local models. And of course, both of our solutions work with both local and non-local models. All right, um, with that, I'll open it up to questions and I'll leave this page up in case folks need to get in touch with us later. Awesome. Great. Thank you both so much. Uh, let me look through, make sure I didn't miss any questions in the chat. Uh, here's one. How did you determine what questions to ask uh, the data set for the data set that you ran it on? Very, very interesting. Jerry, I, I bet you'll, you'll have something to say here too, I think. So the set of questions that we use today are ones that we've actually been using that set of 55 questions um, for close to six months now across a variety of RAG systems that we test. So, you know, part of what we do with Tony Validate is we test various RAG solutions that are on the market. Um, and, and we came up, you know, with a very handcrafted set of test questions that we think fully cover, you know, the 212 essays written by Paul Graham. Now, that's fine when you have a knowledge base of 212 essays. Like 212 is a lot, but it's not like enterprise scale. It's not even small business scale. Like at the end of the day, 212 relatively short essays is just not that much information. So it's easy to kind of, you know, come up with questions that cover it well by hand. Um, oftentimes though, you might want to actually generate a test, uh, a set of synthetic test questions. Um, basically saying, hey, point some solution at your knowledge store and then let it come up with test questions that you can use for evaluation later on. And, and this solution can kind of like make sure that it, it covers well, you know, all of your documents, it covers well the embedding space, et cetera. And that's functionality that Tonic Validate is gonna come out with soon. So I'm excited to announce that shortly. And Jerry, maybe you've seen some other things in the market that also help solve that problem. No, I mean, I was actually about to say, like, I think that makes a lot of sense for you guys to do, given that, I mean, I mean, like, you know, your, your uh, pre-LM solution was like synthetic data generation, just in a completely different domain. Um, yeah. But here it's like you just leverage uh, that concept to generate synthetic data. And and yeah, then a lot of the questions become relevant, right? Like given a set of documents, you want to make sure that you're able to generate not just like really basic questions over like a specific sentence, but actually like generate stuff that ties into, you know, relationships between different chunks of the documents or across documents as well. Um, and I think it actually becomes a very interesting and challenging problem. Um, we have very basic lightweight, uh, uh, a very basic layer in Llama Index that allows you to generate like questions just from simple facts, but it's it's a bit incomplete. Um, like I think you can definitely do it. We actually run it across like a lot of our um, like initial data sets and it's a good way to get started, uh, but it falls below the quality of just like a general human that has an understanding of the document corpus being able to ask these questions. That's right. It's it. it I, I wish I could exactly quote one of the data scientists on our team. It was, it was something to the effect of cr creating tooling to generate like a very good set of synthetic test questions for a RAG system is as hard as building a high quality RAG system. It's like the problems are actually similar and they have similar pitfalls. And yeah, you're right. It, it's easy to get something out there that's like, okay. Um, and it's, it's very hard to do something that actually gives you like the, the, the full confidence that you're 
covering every you know edge case. Um, it's it's an interesting problem, certainly. We have another yeah. question that I'd like to ask before the top of the hour. Uh, when developing RAG applications for clients, an issue that comes up a lot is data privacy. What would you recommend when it comes to deploying and serving these solutions using local models in a cost-effective way, thinking more about deploying for a full team, not just an individual? Um, I'm going to say one thing. I think Jerry's going to be able to say things that are far more intelligent. Um, you can deploy Tonic Validate on your servers. I know that's not exactly what's being asked, but obviously if privacy and person is like forefront of your mind, then of course you're thinking, well, hold on. If I'm, if I care about privacy, I'm not going to send my questions, answers, and context to a web service. Like that's defeating the point of all of this. So Tonic for every solution that we offer is actually, the, it, we deploy it ourselves in a cloud that you can use and you can self-host it. We make the solution available as a set of Docker containers that you can deploy on your servers however you wish, and they run entirely airbound. Um, so from the Tonic Validate side, you'll have no problem with privacy. Jerry, what do you think about the rest of that question, though? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, honestly, I'm probably not actually super qualified to answer this. What I can point to, though, is that there's actually some pretty interesting projects built on top of Llama Index that uh, basically allow you to have some, like, um, Easy, easy way to just like deploy an entire like package solution. Uh, one of these examples is uh, Private GPT. Um, actually, they're built on top of Llama Index, and so um, they have this entire like uh, package rag setup, right? Also with APIs, if you want to customize stuff, that allows you to plug in like a local vector database, uh, Olama. They, are, they switched to using Olama for, for the LLMs, um, as well as like an embedding model stack. And then basically it's just like this entire setup where they actually have this API for you so that you can query it and it all runs locally, right? And, and also if you want to have a UI, they have that as well. And so, yeah, you could, for instance, like take some package like RAG solution like that, bundle it with a solution like, you know, Tonic Validate, um, and and serve it there, um, but yeah, there there's like increasingly like these basically these these like uh, projects and services that allow you to easily deploy this like out of the box rag service uh, locally. Very interesting. Awesome. awesome. Last call for questions. I don't see any left unanswered, so we will probably wrap things up now. Oh, half a question came through. Do you guys have? Let's see if the rest of the question comes through too. Uh, Avi, if you're still here, if you could, yeah, this, this could be a yes or a no, we don't know. <laughs> Do you guys have a guide for a rag? Do we have any guides, uh, ebooks, things like that? Oh, I mean, Llama Index has excellent documentation and examples. I'm sure Jerry can point you to it. Yeah, we, we have a lot. I would just take a look at the docs, docs.llamaindex.ai. Awesome. Yeah, specifically using the men methods mentioned here. Sounds great. Yeah. And of course, I mean, you know, take the notebook and, um, uh, you can always use that notebook as a starting point as well. But I mean, really, the Llama Index documentation is, and I'm not being paid to say this, it, it's really top notch. It, it's a great place to get started with RAG systems. Awesome. I think that's a great, great place to end today. Thanks to everyone for joining us. Thank you for all the great questions. Really informative. Um, Jerry and Adam, thank you for lending us your time and your expertise. I really appreciate it. If you'd like to learn more about Llama Index, head on over to llamaindex.ai, as you can see right here up on the slide, where you can get started using uh, their open source tooling today. And to take full advantage of our integration with Llama Index, visit uh, tonic.ai slash validate, where you can sign up for Tonic Validate for free. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for joining us. And we will see you at our next event. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.